Hi everyone, it's Wesley with 22 Zines. I finally got my library card for my new city, Salem, and I'm really, really excited about it. I am outside right now, as you can tell, and there's some very uh, chipper birds next to me, so hopefully you can hear all right. Um, I guess I'll see what I can do to fix it in post. Anyway, I'm on my way to the library to uh, drop off my very first round of books that I had checked out and probably pick up a few more. And so I wanted to show off the books that I got in kind of like a library haul because they were very interesting <laughs> and it was so much fun checking them out. First I have a few cozy mystery novels and I guess I would kind of describe this whole genre as like a guilty pleasure book and you know cozy mysteries in the sense of like it's a murder mystery that doesn't focus too heavy on the gore it's not like a big hard-boiled thing it's not usually a police in an official police investigation but it's just kind of like a cute pi sort of story is usually what these are um and so like the thing about books like this is that a lot of times they read very straight and very much like for a particular audience of middle-aged white women. <laughs> and I don't know how else to describe that. And this one I think exemplifies why I say that. <laughs> um, it's titled Every Body on Deck by G.A. McEvitt, which is the pseudonym of uh, Sonia Massey, I want to say. Yeah, Sonia Massey. And um, so I got this book because I've been kind of in like a boat mood. That's like a weird thing to say, but I took a ferry down to the aquarium with my partner and it was so fun. And so I've just been like thinking about boats. And so while I was browsing the mystery section, it's like, oh, on deck. Oh, it takes place on a boat. And so what this is, is like, it is a murder mystery that takes place, I mean, it sort of takes place on an Alaskan cruise, but primarily it takes place in the small town that the cruise ship docks at. Um, and here's the thing, it's really bad. Like, and I don't even just mean badly written, I mean there's just straight up racism and sexism, like, throughout this book. And it's, it's like, I did end up finishing the whole thing, because for one, it's like a really quick junk food kind of read but also it's one of those things where it's like you just kind of keep going because you want to see just how bad it gets. So this book it it centers around this uh, PI who is married to a cop and the the thing is like it almost feels like the author goes out of her way to portray this guy as a bad cop except you know the author is trying to say it's like oh well he's the hero he's the loving husband and they love each other and it's perfect and he's great and all of these all these things that he's doing, it's like, oh, it's just like little husband mannerisms. Like, you ladies know how husbands can be. <laughs> the character is super entitled. Like, both the, the woman, the main character, P.I., and her cop husband are, like, super entitled. And he goes around, like, flashing his detective badge to everybody, even though he is not involved in this investigation officially at all. Like, he, as a cop visiting... You know, first, he's not on duty. He is not involved with any official investigation. He does not live in the state. He has absolutely no legal authority. And in fact, it's probably like super illegal for him to try and like impersonate a cop that does have legal authority. Um, <laughs> and he keeps going around like flashing his badge. And then when people are not immediately like, oh, oh dear officer, I'll tell you everything at, at all, he gets, he like, gets aggressive and rude and mean and just awful to all these people. Okay, here's this one part that I think just exemplifies the cop aspect of it. And I and let me just say like the the whole like pro cop thing does seem to be common in these sorts of books or at least not portraying them super negatively, but it has never been just like as outright as this one doing straight up illegal horrible things. So I found a line, a couple lines that I just want to read you real quick, where they're like interrogating a suspect who really they have no reason to suspect for any reason. Like all the suspects in this, it seems they just picked some people at random that looked scary. 
literally like there's some big mafia boss guy who they literally just assumed that he is a mafioso and started tailing him for literally no reason no connection to the person they're supposed to be protecting not like it's ridiculous anyway let me read this bit <laughs> this is just plain stupid dirk whispered in savannah's ear as they watched sergeant Bowden interrogate olive kelly you can't do a proper interview in a bank for pete's sake it's the only building in town with bars savannah replied in an equally hushed voice i heard they had a robbery 50 years ago and that's when they installed them on the windows but where's the intimidation factor how are you supposed to drum up any claustrophobia or good old-fashioned fear of the justice system? He had her there. And then there's a part a little bit later where <laughs> it says, He says, If I had her back home in my sweat box, she'd have spilled her guts a long time ago. And, like, what is especially awful about this, like, quick spoiler, what's especially awful about this is that this this character was a victim the one that they're interrogating and grilling and whatever was a victim and they're trying to like get a confession out of her and press the, or like the the main character the main the cop guy dirk seems to want to just like press a confession out of her where if they had done that they would have been wrong like she was not a murderer so it's just like straight up you know there's shit like that there's a lot of really weird casual sexism and weird racism that's like really makes me feel like there's no way and by the way this was published in 2017 so, <laughs> so there's literally no excuse um and it really feels like this author has just written so many books that the editors just don't even read them anymore. They, they're just like, oh, well, we know they sell. So like, yep, stamp of approval. They don't read it. They don't care. And there's literally parts where like a, um, there's like a Korean butler as they describe her. And she says like, um, basically they're like surprised that she's Korean, like surprised that she's a person of color. And the butler's response to this is, I think you just need to spend more time being served by people like me. What the fuck is that about? Um, and then there's like this one character who literally her only character trait is that she's cheap. And the entire time it's just like jokes about how she's cheap. Every word that out, out of her mouth is about her being like ridiculously cheap. I'll give you like two guesses to figure out what ethnicity she is. She's Jewish. And they just like slide that in at the end about like, they're not quite at the end, but you know, they just slide it in there where it's like, oh great, she's fucking Jewish coded. And it really genuinely feels like they didn't have any character for her. And so it was like, hmm, well, what sort of person would be really cheap so that I can describe the character a little bit more? I know, we'll just be fucking anti-Semitic in it. And what's like, even if you took all that stuff out, which I'm not really a proponent of like, oh, well, if you just ignore the racism and anti-Semitism and the, you know, a gr like abusive cop, you know, cop abusing his power. It's like, you should not avoid ignore all that. But it's sort of like, <laughs> even if this had been written by somebody um, who did not include all that it's still just really bad like it's it's a poorly constructed story it's very boring it doesn't make sense they don't follow their own logic it's supposed to take place in like this teeny tiny alaskan town that's supposed to be like so small that they don't even have a mcdonald's and then there's a character who literally goes shopping for an engagement ring like a fancy diamond engagement ring and goes in and out of six different stores in this tiny ass place so like, yeah, it, <laughs> anyway, it's one of those things that's like, it is so awful that you can't look away. <laughs> that was everybody on deck. But I also checked out A Counterfeit Mystery by Darcy Wilde. I have not finished it yet. I'm still quite at the beginning, but it's actually, it's quite nice. It is a Regency London um, murder mystery. I haven't quite gotten to the murder part yet, but it's very interesting because it's basically like this woman who's sort of on the fringe of of the high society she's like almost there and she 
basically maintains her place among this upper class by becoming the go-to person for investigating all the personal lives of all these people. And so, of course, it's always done with this big veneer of politeness and high society, which is what makes it really interesting. So it's basically just reading like this big, long gossip column. <laughs> and it's it's so interesting to see them sort of navigate the social milieus. I don't know what if that's the word I want to use. But anyway, I'm enjoying this one. It's very well written. Um, it definitely sets the Regency London theme without being too impossible to read or, or hitting you over the head or anything like that. Um, it's been quite comfortable so far, so I'm looking forward to finishing this one. Um, and now for something completely different. I checked out this book, which is Bitten by Witch Fever. And so I, I grabbed it just off the shelf because of this interesting side, and it said Witch Fever, and so I'm like, oh, is this going to be something about, like, magic? And no, it's actually about wallpaper and arsenic in the Victoria in the Victorian home, and it's by an author, Lucinda Hoxley, um, by, published by the National Archives. And so what this book is, is it has a giant, giant collection of wallpaper, uh, like, images of wallpaper samples from the uh, 17th and 18th centuries, <laughs> all of which were found to contain arsenic in the dyes. And so the entire book, like there's, um, it, it goes through with these really big, um, fancy sets of images and just full, full pages. And then they have these little inserts of the actual, of the book part with a lot of historical information about arsenic, about arsenic's popularity in uh, manufacturing, about the outcomes, about legislation, about um, wallpaper designers. It's like really fascinating stuff. I couldn't put it down about about arsenic <laughs> in wallpapers. Okay, so for those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about at all, in the 17th and 18th centuries, uh, a lot of European manufacturers would use arsenic in dyes in uh, pigmentation to create certain colors or certain brighter colors. Um, and so that would be present in the dyes in, um, among many things, wallpaper. And wallpaper was sort of the, uh, wallpaper and clothing were kind of the two big, big things that um, became sensationalized at the time for containing arsenic. And basically, um, there was like a giant debate about whether or not arsenic was actually causing a lot of these illnesses because people would hang up all of these wallpapers and things in their home that had arsenic and they would wear these uh, dresses and things that had been dyed with arsenic and um, experience symptoms of arsenic poisoning, but they didn't recognize it as symptoms of arsenic poisoning necessarily. Very frequently, it was either considered, to, it was either like misdiagnosed as uh, food poisoning or as diphtheria or cholera or all of these other things that were um, common ailments. Or in many cases, people knew and doctors knew that arsenic was causing a lot of these ailments and people just didn't believe it. They thought it was like a a witch hunt, and that's why this is titled uh, Bitten by Witch Fever. And there's a uh, quote on the back that sums up the entire thing quite nicely by William Morris, who is a incredibly famous English wallpaper designer from the time. And he has a quote here, as to the arsenic scare, a greater folly it is hardly possible to imagine. The doctors were bitten as people were bitten by the witch fever. So he's literally thinking that, like, the arsenic scare was a witch hunt and that arsenic was perfectly safe in certain contexts. Um, one being dyes in his wallpaper manufacturing. Um, and so it's just like completely fascinating because you go through all this bit and they have sections where they talk about, um, you know, people knew that arsenic was a poison and there were many murders that were carried out using arsenic and a lot of sensationalized stories about deaths from arsenic. And so I have a little section here that I wanted to read. Um, so a German woman, Geisha Marguerite Gottfried, earned the name the Angel of Bremen for her patient nursing of a succession of her family and friends who perished between 
1813 and 1827. This included both her parents, her three children, her first and second husbands, a fiancé, and her twin brother, 15 people in all, who, as it turned out, were all poisoned by Gottfried, perhaps in an early case of Munchausen syndrome by proxy, in which carers induce illness in others to gain praise and attention. Suspicions were aroused after a doctor was asked to test some white powder that had been found in the food that Gottfried had prepared for friends. It was arsenic. She was arrested on the 6th of March, 1828, and beheaded three years later, thereby becoming the last person to be executed in Bremen. And that is just one of, like, dozens of stories of um, people intentionally using arsenic to murder. And then there's all these instances of people accidentally getting killed from arsenic, especially minors, because I did not realize this, but arsenic is a um it's sort of a naturally present element and so when you are mining for other things arsenic vapors will be released into the air um and you you know without proper protection you will be inhaling arsenic and so a lot of miners would would end up with symptoms of arsenic poisoning um not to mention then the manufacturers that actually used arsenic in the products that they created um so just like really really fascinating stuff and hang on, I have a few other bits that I just wanted to to read or point out. One, which is really cool, is that uh, one of my very favorite novellas or novels or stories or anything of all time is The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman, which was written in 1892. And here's a picture of the cover. And so um, in reading it now, it's very interesting because it kind of gives a portrait about uh, what... Um, what it was like to to be a woman and to have depression in the Victorian era. And basically the, the summary of the story is that her husband, in an attempt to improve her health, <laughs> um, locks her in the, in, in a room to, you know, cool her, her vapors and her feminine wiles and whatever her issues were. Um, but what's really interesting is that, um, now, in the context of this book, uh, it turns out that the yellow wallpaper that she was surrounded with was very likely to contain arsenic, like, in the story, obviously. It's a fictional story, but the, the story was, was playing off of the known fact of arsenical wallpapers and some of the symptoms that you can, uh, that arise from that. And so the, the moist atmosphere um, from the seaside d town that she was in was <laughs> basically causing the arsenic wallpaper to um, release arsenic in forms of gas. And so a lot of the symptoms that the main character experiences, including hallucinations, um, which were sort of attributed to madness and, and captured her going insane in like true gothic style, were actually sort of meant to be... Uh, um, the result of arsenic poisoning, <laughs> which I never knew, and I think that's really cool. They also have an entire section where they talk about arsenic in other uses in the home, um, including, obviously, rat poisons and um, other forms of poison, but, uh, fly paper, that sort of thing, but it was also used as part of a miracle tonic, and it was used as a, um, it was used as a, a cosmetic either both in makeup and as these complexion wafers, arsenic complexion wafers, with the idea that, um, here, I'll just say, one of these, ad quoting, one, of, one advertisement for the wafers described them as for those who desire a transparent, clear, fresh complexion, free from blotch, blemish, roughness, coarseness, redness, freckles, or pimples. It's like, yeah, you aren't going to have those because you're dying. <laughs> you're going to get this pale, pallid, you're dying from arsenic. Um, and there's a, there's a quote here that I think sums it up very well. Strangely, few people seem to be able to make the connection between rat poison containing arsenic and the arsenic used for other day-to-day -day purposes. Um, I just think that's so, that's so funny. It's so, it's so interesting. And so this whole book is just endlessly interesting. And of course it's beautiful too, because it has all of these, um, images of the arsenical wallpapers in it. Um, 
I originally checked this out just because I wanted to scan some of the pages to potentially use as backgrounds and zines, and I ended up becoming completely enamored with it, and um, it's just such a fascinating topic. It's so, it's so funny. Um, and I think the last quote, which this just made me smile, is that um, in 1879, it was observed that households in the United States were buying some 57 million rolls of wallpaper per year, quote, sufficient to girdle the earth at the equator and leave several hundred yards to spare. <laughs> several hundred yards! <laughs> yeah, so I don't know where you'd even find this book, but definitely see if your library has it. It is it is like such a great read. I really love just picking up random books on random topics that end up being completely fascinating and encapsulating and you learn all about this world or this aspect of history that you just had never heard about before. So yeah, this was really fun, bitten by witch fever. I also checked out some manga, as I usually do. <laughs> this one is the Tarot Cafe. Naturally, I had to check this one out. It's by Sang Sun Park, and it's a Korean manga. Um, it's uh, printed left to right. And it's... I kind of didn't expect much from it. I literally just grabbed it at the last second because it was a manga that said tarot on it, so I had to check it out. And it is so good. It is so fascinating. It's It's... It's this very, it, the story is basically of this um, tarot reader who has magical beings like this large cat boy <laughs> uh, come in and ask her special questions uh, about the future. And so then the rest of the story is sort of told um, through the cards where it's like as you, as she is reading the card, she gives the somewhat vague-ish, um, you know, answer about, you know, five of swords. Oh no, a real prince, you know, your romantic competition has arrived. Sometimes unlikely things do happen. And that becomes, that sort of starts as the, uh, starts the rest of the of the story. I feel like I'm not describing this very well, but you know what I mean. It's that it's like it has the tarot cards are framing the story, which is really cool. And just aesthetically, <laughs> I did not really think I'd like it because I wasn't entirely sure about the character style, but it is so fun and there's so many bits where I'm just looking at this and I'm like, "Oh my god, that's that's my gender right there. Where's the where's the <laughs> these two in particular like I just so want to be that I so want to look like that um and it's got these big uh illustrations of tarot cards and I would say and they have um like little brief descriptions about what the cards mean um and I'd say that they're pretty good like it, it seems like this was genuinely done by somebody who loves tarot reads tarot is very interested in tarot um and it's just, it's a very fun read. It's very sparkly. It's like a shoujo drama kind of thing. <laughs> um, oh, and the main character, you might have guessed, you, or you, you will not be surprised. The main character's name is Pamela. And I'll guess, uh, I'll just leave you to figure out where they got that name from. Anyway, uh, there's four volumes of this, at least four that I have checked out. I didn't check if there's any more than that, but I will definitely be reading more about this. <laughs> and another one I checked out was the Sabrina the Teenage Witch manga, which <laughs> it's, it's, it's an American comic drawn in a manga inspired style. It is not really a manga. You know, it's an it's an American comic. It was published by Archie Comics in 2013, which I feel like is surprisingly late. Um, it definitely reads like they were it's Archie Comics trying to get in on the manga craze among young people. And it's very um here's the thing about this <laughs> is that it feels like it doesn't in, it doesn't quite work because it feels like it's almost blending too many things at once. So the the panel arrangement and the panel style is definitely more manga inspired 
with, um, I guess this is a good example with the very uh, diagonal panels, the number of panels per page, definitely very manga inspired. Um, the art style of the characters is, again, manga inspired, this time a little more emphasis on the inspired part because it, it looks very American, if you're familiar with that. Um, and then there's sort of other influences, and I feel like they just don't all entirely mesh well together. One of the influences is definitely American comics and American superhero comics in terms of the um, coloring or rendering, which here is an example of the page. And as you can see, there is very little white space compared to most manga, where um, there is a lot of gradient shading on pretty much every aspect, uh, it, you know, of all of the characters. Their skin, their hair, their clothes, everything has this gradient with some parts darker and then a gradient going to lighter. And when you ultimately put all that together on this page, it almost looks like it was meant to be in color and then they just desaturated the whole thing and did it in, in black and white. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but it, you know, it definitely looks like a colorist or renderer who is used to doing in color because this is not distracting, this is a little easier to read, and then when you have an entire page with uh, this many panels, which is common in manga, um, in this rendering style it just ultimately becomes a little bit hard to parse. Um, and it definitely has the flavor of more American comics that have a ton of shit on every page. Um, which I'm not personally a fan of, but I think it can work. It just needs to be done either in color or it needs to be done with some heavier lines, really dark spot blacks everywhere, and you don't get as much of that everywhere. It's like they're they're somewhat hesitant to use a pure a pure black or pure white. I guess we get some of it. You know, you get some dark blacks, but really, like, there's there's gradient shading everywhere. As opposed to a manga where you, uh, I'll just pull up the Tarot Cafe since I have it sitting here, you get a lot more white space. Like, here's just a sample page. You have a lot more dark darks, you have a lot more white whites, and there's very little shading on the character. There's, like, a harsh drop shadow. Or here, you have some shading, but it's, like, very cut out from a screen tone. So it just reads a little bit differently and you can definitely see the American influence in this. Um, the other thing that just is a little weird is that the script feels so much like it could have easily been written for uh, any Archie comic, whether it was a manga or not. Like, if you had just done a different art style and maybe a slightly different panel arrangement, you could use the exact same script in the classic Archie style, very square panels, very straightforward. It's not, it, it doesn't have quite the same storytelling elements that you'd find in a manga or that you would find in, in certain America, Americanized, um, what am I trying to say, in certain manga inspired American comics like Scott Pilgrim or something like that, where it's a little bit like, it just, feels a little bit different. It tastes a little bit different. Um, this definitely, like, the whole thing put together reads like the Archie execs were like, hey, let's do a manga, and used all of their same people to do it, and um, were just trying to capture the manga craze among young people, and they wanted to keep it very, you know, not just family friendly, but like family readable as in everybody would be able to read it. And it, it just turned out like this, <laughs> a bit of a mishmash, I suppose. It's certainly very interesting and I'm going to check out and read the rest of it just because I've always been a Sabrina fan. And in general, I just, it's just funny. Like it's, it's interesting <laughs> to read this, um, to read a manga version of Archie comics. And I gotta point out that my favorite, um, e so each story is basically, each chapter is a relatively self-contained story, which is another aspect that makes it feel a lot like the American Archie comics, is that you don't need to read the entire volume, you can read one, you know, there's a few lingering threads, but not really. You pretty much just read it in chunks like you would any other Archie comic. Um, 
that said, my favorite um, chapter story, my favorite story that they have included in this is titled Salem Mania. And this is Salem in this, uh, in this book. And basically, uh, a Japanese toy maker sees Salem and decides to make a toy and franchise out of him a la Hello Kitty. And it's really funny. And I feel like it's, it feels a little bit self-aware. Um, and it feels like they're just kind of poking fun at the American obsession with Japanese culture for the sake of consumerism, like Japanese pop culture. Um, I just think it's really, it's really funny. It's really interesting. And I bookmarked this page just because I do like this image a lot. And this was a fun story too, The Magic Within. It's got this cool goth girl who's mortal, um, introduces her. Oh man, the other thing is that like they introduced a romantic rival for Harley and his name is uh, Shinji. And he is, he is literally like blue haired anime guy. Like he was, he was definitely anime guy before. And then at some point they dropped the fact that he's supposed to have blue hair. And I'm just like, Oh my God, you really did that. <laughs> anyway, so that's uh, Sabrina, the teenage witch, the maga, the mat, the magic within <laughs> also known as Sabrina, the manga. And the last thing I have to share, I actually did not check out from the library. I picked up from a bookstore called Commonwealth Books while I was visiting in Boston nearby. And I just had to share it because it is so wild. It is The Good Man of Paris, a treatise on moral and domestic economy by a citizen of Paris circa 1393, translated by Eileen Power from French um, and sort of and updated for modern readers. Uh, but the translation is from 1928. So basically, this book is a handbook that a French nobleman, um, or not exactly a nobleman, but he was like part of, as they describe it, the enlightened haute bourgeoisie uh, upon which the French monarchy was coming to lean with increasing confidence. So he was basically like a, a rich wealthy upper class guy who now is writing this guidebook on how to be a good wife to instruct his wife and as you would expect from something written in 1393 it is incredibly sexist and and weird and bad and it's it's fascinating to see how many of these um ideas about how to be a good christian wife ended up filtering down and like are still being somewhat maintained. So as an example for some of the contents, each section is labeled. There's, you know, article one, to salute and thank God on waking and rising and to be suitably clad. Article two, to be suitably accompanied. Um, article five, to be loving of your husband. Article six, to be humble and obedient to your husband. And alongside each, uh, article are basically these descriptions that are trying to be like myths or fables or recalling some old thing that are very clearly invented um, to try and illustrate his point. And so it would be things like, here's the story of this wife from Rome who ended up gossiping about her husband's business. And as a result, um, it was ruled that her child could never join the Roman Senate because uh, she couldn't be trusted and all the, it's like weird things to try and illustrate the, you know, fables to try and illustrate the central moral of don't gossip or whatever he is trying to say in that case, right? So what I thought I would read is the section that I just randomly flipped through and ended up reading in the bookstore that ended up making me actually buy this book. And it is part of the section uh, to be humble and obedient toward your husband. What's interesting about this one in particular is it feels very much like simultaneously trying to justify the uh, charter or the guidebook that this guy has written for his wife. And in addition to the, the moral about being humble and obedient to your husband. And so basically the story so far is that there's a husband and wife and the wife had been disobedient and um, slanderous of her husband and all these things. And so what happened is that, um, 
the wife must needs in her pride have her rights set down clearly point by point and the obediences and services that the friends told her she must pay to her husband set down and written in articles on the one hand and this and that from her husband to her on the other hand and thus they might dwell together if not in love at least in peace and so literally <laughs> they figured, all right, how are we going to get this woman to to agree and figure things out? We'll write down a guide. The husband and the friends, who the concerned friends, <laughs> concerned friends are all going to write down like a guidebook of all the things that she is obliged to her husband for, all the things she's obliged to do for him. Um, <laughs> okay. One day they were going on a pilgrimage, and it behoved them to pass by a narrow plank over a ditch. The husband went first, and then turned and saw that his wife was fearful, and dared not come after him. And the husband was adrad, lest if she should come, the fear itself should make her fall. And kindly he returned to her, and took and held her by the hand, and leading her along the plank, held her and talked to her, assuring her that she should have no fear. And so went the good man backwards, and talking the while. So the husband had crossed the log, seeing that his wife didn't want to cross the log, he goes back and um, tries to sate her fears because he was worried that it was the fact that she was nervous that would make her fall. So he's talking to her, trying to trying to calm her down, and walking backwards across the log. Meanwhile, the woman just does not want to walk across this dangerous log above a raging river. <laughs> then fell he into the water that was deep, and he struggled hard in the water to save him from the danger of drowning, and caught and held on to an old plank that had fallen therein long time past and was floating there. And he cried to his wife that with the help of her staff that she bore, she should draw the plank to the bank of the stream and save him. But she answered thus, Nay, nay, quoth she, I will look first in my charter, whether it be written therein that I must do so. And if it be therein, I will do it, and otherwise not. She looked therein, and because that her charter made no mention thereof, she answered that she would do not, and left him and went her way. So for those who didn't quite get what happened, the guy falls in the river and starts drowning, asks her for help, and she very cheekily responds that she needs to check her charter to see if it's in the rules that they were outlined to her on how to be a good wife, that she is obliged to try and save her husband from drowning. Long time was the husband in the water until he was at the point of death. The lord of the land and his people passed by the place and saw him and rescued him when he was nigh dead. They caused him to be warmed and eased, and when that speech returned to him, they asked him what had befallen, and he told them. Then the Lord caused the wife to be followed and taken and had her burnt. Now you see to what an end pride brought her, that in her great disobedience was fain so straightly to keep her rights against her husband. So literally... <laughs> You know, woman responds cheekily, well, it's not in the guidebook, so I don't need to rescue her. He gets rescued by a lord, and then somehow this this random wandering lord has the authority to have her literally burned to death for, for not trying to save her husband or whatever. <laughs> and this is supposed to be a lesson not about maybe don't be such a dick and give your wife an outline for how to be a good wife. Obviously, this guy would not feel that way, having given her such an outline. This is about the woman being prideful <laughs> and being snarky. Anyway, so this is just a really interesting book. It's really good. It's, it's such an interesting portrait of the expectations that were placed upon wives in the uh, Middle Ages and Renaissance, especially from this high, high society. Um, <laughs> and there's a whole section on gardening and cooking and how to instruct your servants properly. Um, there's literally recipes in here for how it's things like how to make savory rice or a tart or four dishes of meat jelly. And I'm not entirely sure why the wife would need to know this if she has servants to instruct, but whatever. <laughs> like, definitely a very engaging book and so I had to share this one off too. All right thanks for joining me on my library haul. I can't wait to go and uh, return some of these and get some new books to haul out and uh, make sure that you visit your local library to find interesting gems like this. I will see you later. Bye.